Hello, my name is Robert Bomander, and I am a big ear birder. And this is the Big Ear Podcast. Welcome. I did a big year in North America in 2012 when I wasn't even a birder. I decided that after seeing the movie The Big Year and reading the book The Big Year, I would see what it was like. I had a job that had me traveling across North America and decided I'm going to see if I can pretend I'm a big ear birder and maybe see 300 species. Well, it became very addicting and I eventually saw 600 species that year. In 2022, being a Canadian and having never seen the entire country, I decided to do a Canada big year. I did end up seeing 456 species from one end of Canada to the other. And now I'm taking a little pause in my birding adventures and getting to know some of the birders of the North American provincial state and Canada big years. Tonight, we have Eve Morell, who is a big year birder from 2017. We ran into each other in Texas and California during her big year and eventually saw the California condor together, along with a blue-footed booby on a Debbie Shearwater pelagic. So, without further ado, or with some ado, stay tuned, and coming up next, after this momentary pause, is my reminiscence with Eve Morell from 2017. Welcome to episode two of the Big Year Podcast. My guest today is Eve Morell, who in 2017 did an ABA plus Hawaii big year and saw in the ABA area 760 species. Welcome to the show, Eve. Thank you for joining me. Hi, how are you? I am excellent and you're doing well. Uh, obviously, just birding as a pastime rather than as an obsession now. Well, once you do a big year, you never bird the same way again. <laughs> so I'm, kind of, I'm constantly doing big years. <laughs> Well, that has been my fate as well. So tell me about the inspiration for the big year and tell me uh, what got you into birding in the first place. Well, my parents were naturalists, so I grew up exposed not just to birds, but to nature in general and having an appreciation of the natural world. So when I was in my 30s, I went to Costa Rica with a biologist who was doing research there and one day it was raining and we had nothing else to do and he had an extra pair of binoculars and he said, well, we could look for birds. And I had never looked at birds through a pair of binoculars and it, that just changed my world. And, you know, for many, for several decades, I just birded like most people for fun, uh, occasionally, you know, going to a park and just seeing what I could identify. It wasn't until my husband died and birding became more of a focus because I had a lot of time on my hands and I needed something to help me get through it. And so birding provided that outlet. And I thought, you know, I always wanted to see at least 600 species before I died. Mm. And um, I was 59 in 2017 and I thought, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. and so I decided that I would do a big year and try to get to my goal. And my initial goal was just to see 600 species. Mm -hmm. And as you know, that just snowballed and my competitive nature immediately <laughs> caught fire. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I, I saw 600 species by May and mm -hmm. I thought, wow. Um, I, I have a shot at this. Mm -hmm. And you so, had already been to Attu at that time? Um, I had. After. Um, I went to Attu in May, and that was kind of a, a big piece of the puzzle because mm -hmm. like a lot of birders, seeing the movie, and, and I was personal friends with Greg Miller, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted Attu to be part of my big year and so that is not always an easy thing to achieve now since you can't fly there yes. and so i wanted to make sure that there was going to be a trip mm -hmm. by boat so once i knew that that trip was happening that kind of set the tone for definitely doing my big year as we all know the daily grind of a big year really takes it out of you and was there a point at which you just said, I just have to accept 
the grind, the travel, the money, the sleepless nights. The loneliness. The loneliness. <laughs> After speaking to a lot of big year birders, I think all of us um, reach a point during the year. For me, it was August where you kind of question your sanity and, and wonder why on earth you are doing this crazy endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once you've basically seen most of the breeding birds in the United States, you're kind of waiting for vagrants to show up. And that part becomes really difficult because obviously you're not going to convert on every bird that you chase. And when you fly across the country to chase the bird and you miss, it, it's very psychologically exhausting. And, you know, you have a two or three of those in a row and you are really, really in a bad place. I think happened. in August, like, I considered abandoning it. Mm. And then you, you kind of get, you see a bird that you chase and you get re-energized and, and you go forward. In my opinion, the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life and the thing that I'm the most proud of. I think that can be said of a lot of big year birders in my Canada big year in 2022. I flew to Newfoundland for a bird, flew all the way to Vancouver for a bird and missed it, and then flew all the way to Nova Scotia for another bird and missed it. So the frustration can get to you. And I just decided at that point, I'm going to celebrate the birds that I see and celebrate the adventure for the birds I don't see. By the end of August, when you sort of got your second win, that's basically how you felt as well? Yes, and I, I think, again, you have to have some level of ego to want to do this. And so you're always struggling between your love of birds and just wanting to enjoy the experience and also trying to go for the record. It would be disingenuous of me to say that that wasn't constantly on my mind. Of mm -hmm. course, you want the glory mm -hmm. of setting a record or at least getting close to the record, but also you want to enjoy the process because at the end of the day, it's a personal endeavor. And if you're only doing it for the glory, you're going to be very disappointed because you're the only one that it really, really matters to. I, I can fully agree with that. My 2012 big year was really just about me learning to be a birder. I knew that there was going to be no record, but it was going to be really the personal journey of seeing what it was like to be a birder and what it was like to experience the life of a big year as well. And I think that changed me forever as well, as you said, it changed you. It, it does, and it, it, it gives you an inner strength that translates to every aspect of your life. I, I am so comfortable with myself because I spent an entire year alone. In order to do that, you have to have a fortitude, which interestingly, during the pandemic, I was perfectly comfortable with the amount of time that I had to spend alone because I had already done it. My feature of my personality is alone is better than in groups and only, being with one other person only is slightly better than being alone. That is what has enabled me to do it. But I've all, I also luckily had the support of Sue at home who didn't exactly love me rushing off to Vancouver and then Newfoundland and then Alberta over the course of two weeks, never took it away from me either. And one of the things Sandy uh, mentioned to me as well is that uh, a good spouse or a good partner or a good friend will say, if you feel you need to do it, I may not be there every day to support you, but I want you to be happy and that will, if that makes you happy, then you should do it. I had that in my life, but you, that year you did not. And, you know, this, this brings up an interesting point. Um, you cannot discuss big year efforts as a woman without factoring in the difference between the sexes. Let's face it, if, if I had been married, if my husband had still been alive, it would have been a much more difficult process because I feel that men have more support at home from a wife than the other way around. There aren't too many men that are comfortable with you running off every week to fly somewhere and basically spend an entire year doing something away from home. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm not sure if I would have had that opportunity had I not been alone. Now that, that brings up uh, some of the other women who have done big years and I'm sure you've uh, talked to many of them and is that a, a, an experience they had as well? Well, you know, Laura Keene uh, is one of the women that she was married when she did her big year and her husband was very supportive. But I think that's, that's a very unique situation. Most of the other female big year birders that I know were single. It speaks to something that is not brought up a lot in mm. birding, and that is the experience as a female birder is different than the experience as a male birder. Just even uh, take, for example, you're doing a big year and you have to go look for owls. You don't have to worry about going to a dead end road in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> It's a consideration for a woman every time you're on a trail, every time you're birding late at night or super early in the morning, that you're alone in an environment where you could be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had a couple of instances during my big year where I was in some danger. And luckily, I have enough street smarts to, to have figured out a way to get out of the situation. But it's a component that also wears on you while you're doing a big year as so a woman. I know in 2012, uh, like you said uh, earlier, the August is that point where you think you're going crazy. Uh, and I certainly remember standing in the middle of nowhere in Texas with sweat dripping down my legs, thinking, what the hell am I doing? And, and looking around to see if there were any people that might be looking to hurt me or rob me. Yeah, it, it can be very tense situation. I don't know if you ran into it in uh, Texas, uh, walking along the Rio Grande River when suddenly out of nowhere, some guy in camo gear with a big rifle comes walking up to you and it turns out to be well, a border patrol. <laughs> yes, that happened a lot. And in fact, my incident that I referred to um, happened to me in Laredo, Texas, uh, where I knew better, but I went um, down a trail that was basically a dead end trail and two men followed me Oof. and you know luckily because I speak fluent Spanish I was able to turn the situation around by talking to them and trying to diffuse what what was developing mm. but yes I feel like Texas was one of the most interesting places to bird mm -hmm. uh, because of all of those factors of being spending so much time on the border. And uh, what was your favorite Texas bird, by the way? Oh, wow. That's, that's a toughie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mexican violet ear really comes to mind uh, because I had to fly from Alaska to chase that bird. And it was one of those situations where you love as a birder where you pull up and everybody's already on the bird. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, you're always so thankful. You also think, well, that was way too easy. I wish it, there had been like three more minutes of effort. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's a, that's a double-edged sword. You go, wow, that was it? I already have this bird? Um, but then you think about all of the other days. In fact, uh, the longest I ever spent on one bird was five days. And that was only because I had flown to Nome <laughs> Alaska, and it's so expensive to get there, and I said, I'm not leaving without finding this bird. So that that was a little crazy. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. Time management is such a key component of your big year, but we're also human, and I I should have never spent five days on hmm. one bird, Did you? but I was determined. Did you, what was the bird, by the way, if you can remember? Uh, pot, it was a first ABA record pied weed ear. Ooh, very nice. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think I had three first ABA records and nine code pied birds. I think I'm at the point myself just in terms of, of 
new birds for my ABA life list that they're all seem to be code four or five birds at this point. Uh, there's nothing. Yeah, nothing I think that is the truth. And, and, and last year I got a little bit of the buzz. Last January I went up and chased the stellar sea eagle in Maine. I went up on January 1st and, and got it. And then I, I thought, wow, you know, there, there's a lot of good birds showing up. So I went from there and, and chased the Lapland longspur, then went for the blue mockingbird mm. in New Mexico and spent about a month doing the big year thing. And then I, I, I thought, no, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Way up in northern Ontario, we have a Lewis's woodpecker, which should not be there. And a few uh, people have been like, oh, can I get a ride? Anyone got a ride? And so I decided to take a couple of 20-something birders up there on Saturday to go see it. And many times during the course of your own big year, people step up and help you with a bird or drive you somewhere because you couldn't get a rental car. And to me being able to return that favor even if it's to someone else uh and add the the bird to my to my canada life list as well which is uh also a thing once a lister always a lister i i, I have so many lists it's ridiculous <laughs> but in the last couple of years um you know now i live in georgia and mm -hmm. i live on the coast and the birding here is tremendous we have so much habitat and so much safe land, protected land, mm -hmm. that I've really uh, become more hyper-focused, I guess, on my local birding. Mm -hmm. I, I think what brings me the most pleasure now is using my skill set to find my own birds, find my own rarities. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm more focused on my county and state list now as opposed to my ABA list. Ever planning on doing a state big year? I, I moved to Georgia uh, four years ago, and every year I try to get at least 300 species in the state. Mm -hmm. So it kind of puts me in flight big year mode because, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's hard to do in any state. But this year, um, I'm kind of proud of this accomplishment. I've only been on the coast for a little over two years, mm -hmm. and I just saw my 300th uh, bird for my county. Oh, neat. Which, yeah, which is something only six other people have ever done in this state. Uh, so, for not for my county, but just for any county in Georgia. So, um, you know, I'm pretty proud of that achievement, especially when the majority of the birds have been self-found. Mm -hmm. So, again, that's, that's what brings me joy now is finding my own rarities mm -hmm. and exposing other people to those fine. And, and for me, that was the difference between my first year birding in 2012, where I had to be led around the country practically to get to see all the birds I did. But this past year when I was doing Canada, I did it pretty much by myself. Some of the rarest birds I saw, I was the only one there and there was absolutely no one to go yay with. <laughs> How often did that happen to you? Uh, many times, and, and <laughs> it's a very interesting phenomenon when you go somewhere and you are completely alone and you see this real, and you have this really unique experience. And like you said, you have no one to celebrate it with. But that's where, to me, social media really came into play. Mm -hmm. You know, I decided that I would have a blog during my big year, and that added another component of work where, you know, at, at night I had to download photos mm -hmm. and, and write up something about the experience, but it brought other people into the experience and they were rooting me on. And so it gave me motivation when I was struggling, um, but also it exposed these birds to people that only bird locally or people mm -hmm. that didn't bird at all and gave them a greater appreciation. And again, that you know, that's what you hope to achieve with this process. It's just exposing people to the to the wonders of nature and to hopefully get people motivated to protect these birds. Having Instagram handy to share some of the most exciting birds I had when I was all by myself. I don't I have no one here to high five with, but Yes. I get some criticism for 
wanting to bird alone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have a tendency to rarely bird with other people. And it's partly because I can be more focused mm-hmm. and and I, I enjoy that process of being alone and having to having to find my own birds. And I, I just find it a little more distracting when I'm with other people birding. Yeah, that I can understand that uh, very much so. Sometimes when I'm birding with other people, I tend to almost lay back and let them find the birds. Exactly. But so now one of the things, again, that I'm, I'm concentrating on this year is uh, becoming more involved in the land trust here mm-hmm. and trying to save some of the some of these uh, key habitats. And I also spend uh, a good bit of time helping with shorebird surveys. In fact, I'm getting ready to go do one in the next couple of days. But um, the thing, I guess, that I took away from my big year that I didn't fully understand prior is distribution and habitat. I think Mm -hmm. those were the two things that I learned that I didn't really have a grasp. Uh, you know, when you're burning locally, you don't totally get it, mm-hmm. if you if you know what I mean. Oh, I, I do, because I knew that there were regular sparrows in my front yard, which was, I thought, that's just like all the sparrows. And I knew that there were blue jays and cardinals. And then I go to California for my first trip of my 2012 big year and it's just like an entire world that I did not know existed then you're in Florida and then you're in Texas and then you're in Arizona and it's like oh my goodness this is unbelievable that all this exists and yes my obsessive compulsive behavior with the desire to make lists and take pictures kind of was the inspiration the learning curve of realizing that it was more than just that that it was learning about the habitats and the vulnerability of the species and how rare some birds are and how hard it is to see certain species and it just exactly even though something, something amazing. might be a coat one or two even is can sometimes be very difficult when you have to go find it i mean you might see it once during your year when you're birding but to go out and try to find that species when you're when you need it that day that's a much different story (laughs) that 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 was that can be a killer what was the most disappointing miss in 2017 oh gosh uh well there was a cuban peewee Ah. that showed up in miami and, you know, um, I was a Florida birder, so mm. it was in my backyard. I was literally there a half hour after it was found. We spent two days looking for it, mm. never resurfaced. Then, immediately after that, another Code 5 bird showed up about half an hour away, loggerhead kingbird. Oh. Again, I, w- I was told about it and went there immediately. The bird was never relocated. So that was two back-to-back misses. Mm -hmm. But ironically, the loggerhead kingbird ended up being the last bird I saw in 2017 because another one showed up Uh. in Miami in December. So it kind of came full circle. Well, we spent a day in Texas looking for a jabiru and didn't find it. But we did find a black rail. Uh, Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Which, you know, again, you never know during a big year who's going to help you. Mm -hmm. And someone just mentioned, is there anything else you need Mm -hmm. that you don't have this year? And I I said jokingly, yeah, well, I I need a black rail. (laughs) And then then the person said, well, we had one yesterday. (laughs) And we all went over there, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Which, you know, again, it's so interesting that, you know, you and I met during my big year and I think we met on a pelagic and yeah. then we decided to go chase the bird together yeah. after that. Yeah, the California condor. It was quite the yeah. walk to get up there. Uh, it was a good oh hike. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We, you know, we again, that was a bird that people were seeing from the parking lot. Of course, the day we went, mm-hmm. it was so hot and we had to climb all the way up. 
It so wasn't. Finally, get the bird. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as the Kalima warbler hike. No, not quite. No, no. Uh, Kalima is definitely. If you do the long trip, mm -hmm. that's that's a heck of a hike. Uh, I, the first time I did that trip, I did not see a Kalima warbler. The second time, I took the short way up, and as soon as I saw it, grabbed a few pictures, and then went back down the same way because the first time I did the entire bottom to top around the horseshoe and all the way down, and that was. That was a nine to five day. That was a long day. <laughs> well, I did. I went from the condor, the hike that you and I did. I went from there and then in the same week hiked up for Himalayan snowcock and did the Kalima hike all no. in the same week. <laughs> that might have been a lot of Advil after at the end of the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, and again, you know, people don't consider, uh, the physical aspect of a mm. big year. You have to be in pretty good shape to kind of handle all of the hiking, driving, flying that you have to do in one year. And what I find amazing about that is so many of the birders who have done big years have done it after the age of 50 or even 60. And it kind of makes you realize that the people in the best shape after 60 turn out to be bird watchers. <laughs> not something that most people consider a sport mm -hmm. but when you're doing it at that intensity it really is like a sport and, and the the competitiveness is there like a sport and yet it's the only sport where your competitor will help you get another bird even if it might cost them the win well you know the the last bird that I saw was Loggerhead Kingbird, which also ended up being uh, Reuben and Victor Stoll's last bird that mm -hmm. year. And we all got it together. So, and it was actually Victor who found it uh, for the whole group of people that was there. And uh, he got me on the bird. So it, it was kind of a nice way to end the competition. Mm -hmm. So you ended up with seven, uh, 760 that year. And and what was the record uh, at the time? Uh, the record was 782, I believe. Yeah, that's John Weigel's number. And then, you know, he did another big year and ended up beating his own record. And I just don't believe that that's a record that's going to be broken. But, you know, I, yeah. I was just looking at the numbers. And then you were doing the big year the first year that Hawaii was added to the ABA area? Yes. And I, you know, I debated... Uh, whether to include it because, you know, there was so much controversy surrounding that decision. Mm. But at the end of the day, I had never birded Hawaii and I wanted to. And part of that effort was to draw attention to the honey creepers and how vulnerable they, they are. Mm -hmm. And I just decided that it was something I wanted to, to have as part of my big year. And, and well, you yes, should. You know, if I had stayed on the mainland, for those additional two and a half weeks that I spent in Hawaii, mm -hmm. I probably could have added at least two or three more vagrants to my ABA list, you know, continental ABA mm -hmm. list. But you have to decide what's important to you. Like, mm -hmm. again, it speaks to what I said earlier. You have to do this for you, not for everybody else. That, absolutely. With Hawaii, uh, what was your final number? 816. That's uh, so you can get a lot of good birds in Hawaii over uh, over fifty birds. You can, and and granted, a lot of them are not native, mm -hmm. but I don't have a though. problem with that. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed all of the birding that I did in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and the the opportunity to go on pelagics in Hawaii, mm, yes. and you know the richness of the pelagic birds there it's you know it's incomparable so i'm i'm really really happy that i included it yeah, i find it interesting that if you go to the narba website where they have the lists of the aba records they have separated the aba plus hawaii and the continental one for people who are supposedly the purists yes and again, this is what I'm saying. Had I not done Hawaii, my place, I guess, in big year history would have been possibly better, but we'll never know. You did it for you. And as we've been talking, uh, doing big years has to be as much for yourself, if not more so than breaking the record. But at a certain point, the record does become the thing. The Canadian record for a Canada big year was... 
457. And when I started, my, my goal was only to just bird all of Canada, go to all the provinces and territories and, and see as many birds as I could. But suddenly you're at 440 and then you're at 450 and then the record is see seemingly in reach. And I went all out for the last two weeks and fell one short with 456, but not a shred of disappointment either. Exactly. And I, I was very lucky that I had Victor and Ruben to compete with because mm -hmm. it propelled me to try harder. I think if you're just doing it without competitors, you, you might have a tendency to maybe not work quite as hard during those difficult times towards the end. But December was one of my best months mm. because I just got re-energized with the competition and working as hard as I possibly could. And with me last year, it didn't seem like there was going to be any competition at all. So I was... I got to a point leading up to August and then this one other birder was always the top birder in Canada every year, even if he hadn't necessarily come close to the record. He ended up propelling me to get over 450 and then win the year by one species. But I wouldn't have even hit 450 without the competition. Exactly. I have, um, I guess, mixed feelings. Maybe you do or don't, but I don't know in retrospect if, I would have done a big year knowing what I know now. Mm. <laughs> I think um, it is such a difficult feat that if you really know the truth about how difficult your year is going to be, maybe you would be hesitant to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you uh, have to be a little naive to start it and, and complete yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I, I think I labeled my photographic my experience from that year when I was still quite naive. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> that is that is how I felt about it. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know if I would ever have the fortitude to do it again. Mm -hmm. Which is and why the two people, John and Sandy, who have done it twice, amaze me sometimes. Yes. Because, and, and now Victor and Ruben, too. Yeah. They, you know, they've done it again. It's beyond belief to me that, that anyone would want to do this again. But it's not that different, like I said, that I've been in big year mode pretty much every year since. I travel all over Georgia every day looking yeah. for birds, so I guess it's not much different. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just the it's just the distance of travel more so than the the days involved. Exactly, when you just tell people that you went to Alaska ten times in one year, mm -hmm. and that's and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you know, I went to California fifteen times. That just sounds really insane. In, in Canada, you know, that all the time, all the trips I took to British Columbia, and then flew from British Columbia to. St. John's, Newfoundland, and then directly to Edmonton, Alberta, and then to Ontario, and then a day later having to go back to Halifax, Nova Scotia. So yes, it's and Sue is you're going to British Columbia. Well, well I have to. There, <laughs> there, there's a California scrub jay there. That's that's we don't get those in Canada very often, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> I have to go. Yeah, I think I ended up flying 127,000 miles. <laughs> and and you just love the second half of the year where you uh, were flying business class and on air miles the the last six months. <laughs> no, that did not happen to me because I had no allegiance to any airline. Ah. Because I was flying spur of the moment mm -hmm. and it was whatever I could find. And that was the irony of it is that I couldn't build any kind of brand loyalty. And I always got the worst flights and the worst seats. <laughs> And the worst fares. <laughs> because I'm in Canada, I got to fly Air Canada almost exclusively. So I did get a few perks for the second half of the year, which I guess that's one of the advantages of having a national airline. <laughs> yes, you were very lucky. <laughs> uh, so the Logger Head Kingbird was your last bird, but was that the, for me last year, the Stellar Sea Eagle was the pinnacle and like the bird I said, best day ever. What was the bird you got that you said, best day ever? The 
Ivory Gulf in mm. Flint, Michigan, by far. Just the the story behind it, the, the people that were there trying to see that bird, how difficult the day became, how cold it was, mm. everything about the experience. And then the bird died oh. a day a day after I had seen it. And and even now, I am still friends with people that I met at that stakeout. Outside of birding, I don't have friends, but the friends I've made birding are the ones that have become the most special part of birding for me. Well, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting community in that what other aspect of life would you stay at a stranger's home whose mm-hmm. last name you didn't even know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or get in the car with some guy who some other guy said he'll take you to the bird and okay because I, I ran into two situations where I couldn't get a rental car and you know I reached out to the community and well I can't take you but this guy will okay I'll get I'll get in his car sure. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite stories is when I uh, landed in Baltimore to go see my family, and I looked on Facebook and saw that one of my followers had seen a northern solid owl oh. that day. And so I, I didn't know him, but I sent him a message, and I said, well, I just landed in Baltimore. Is there any way that you can give me more information on this bird? Mm-hmm. And he said, better than that, I'll meet you there and take you to see it. Oh, wow. So I, I got an Uber and told the Uber driver to take me to this park. It was a dead-end road. Mm. And she said, let me get this straight. <laughs> I'm dropping you off with your suitcase to meet a guy you've never met at a dead-end road in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that, in a nutshell, is birding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And he, um, you know, he, he got me the bird and it was, it was just a great experience. And that, you, like you said, that is in a nutshell what the hobby is about. Yes. And what advice would you give to wannabe young folks who are thinking that, yeah, one day I want to do a big year. What would you, your advice be in terms of how should I approach it? When should I do it? What do I need to be prepared for? And why the heck should I not do it at all? Well, I uh, just had this experience here in Georgia. You know, a young man was doing a big year for Georgia, mm. and I, I basically gave him the same advice that I give everyone. It'll be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, but just remember to enjoy the process. Because at the end of the day, like I told you, it's a personal journey. So if you're doing it and aren't going to enjoy it, then stop. Absolutely. And that's why I think every time I hit a bird that I had traveled a long way to see that I didn't see and I wanted to kick myself and think, why did I even come here? when I could have been somewhere else, I realized this trip was fun. I had a great time. And just imagine that the trip was about the trip and not the bird, and suddenly you feel better. And you go, well, I met these two people I never would have met in my entire life. And then those same two people I met in Point Pelee three months later. And not getting the bird that day didn't even matter anymore because I got to enjoy something that I never would have. And of course, it's all the places you go and the that you would never go in your entire life. Birding exposes you to the most beautiful places in the world, and you have all sorts of other experiences. It's not just about the birds. Absolutely. It's it's the steak dinner after you see the rarest bird you've ever seen. Exactly. (sighs) Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate talking to you. It was fun birding with you back in 2017, and... You know, without the California condor, you would have had 759. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm glad I, I could share that. Well, thank you for having me and nice talking to you. Well, if I get down to Georgia again, I will look you up. So, yeah, look me up and I'll be glad to take you birding here on the coast. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye bye. Well, that was a lot of fun reminiscing with Eve Morell about her 2017 big year and our unsuccessful chase for the Jabiru and our successful hike to see the California condor. And in 2019 or so, I think just before COVID hit, uh, she helped me find rose ring parakeets 
in Naples, Florida. So that was very exciting. Well, next week, we are going to take a break from the North American big ear birders and talk to an Ontario big ear birder. Kia Jasper did a Ontario big ear in 2022 while I was back and forth across Canada and only occasionally in Ontario. And he, along with a couple of other Ontario birders, broke the all-time big year record for Ontario. And Kia was number one in the province in 2022. And join me next time as we get to know each other a little bit better as we very rarely interacted during the 2022 big year, mostly in Point Pelee in the spring. So thank you again for joining me on the Big Year Podcast. My name is Robert Bomander and I, yes, am still a big year birder and will look forward to you hearing me next time.